Good morning. I am really excited for us to start our brand new series in the book of Acts today. Acts is one of the most explosive and electrifying books of the Bible. We get to see what happened immediately after Jesus' public execution and resurrection from the dead and how these seismic events completely changed people's lives and eventually completely changed the world. Acts documents the explosive birth of the early church and the electrifying first 30 years of church history. We're going to see lots of firsts. We're going to see the very first Christian sermon preached by Peter the fisherman. We're going to see the very first Christian martyr, a young guy called Stephen. We'll see the first African convert from Ethiopia. We'll see the first Roman convert with an elite soldier called Cornelius. And we're going to see the very first European convert, a businesswoman called Lydia. What we see is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is profoundly relevant for everybody, regardless of their race, religion, rank, IQ, or gender. To this day, Christianity remains the most diverse multicultural movement in the history of the world. If you're visiting, thinking, well, the church isn't really for people like me, Acts is going to show you the gospel of Jesus Christ is exactly for people like you. Now, the, the popular phrase that people use, a Damascus experience, that comes from this book, meaning to make a sudden realization and a change of direction. One person whose life was radically changed by Jesus was a highly educated Greek historian called Luke. Now, Luke, he lived during the time of these events. He was an eyewitness to much of what happened. He wrote Acts for a friend of his called Theophilus, but also for the public, including us, and he says in his prequel book, where he records the life of Jesus, that he, quote, carefully investigated everything from the beginning and wrote an orderly account to give a certainty of the facts. Everything from the beginning, orderly account to give us certainty of the facts. And if you look right at the start of the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1, have a look there with me. He now writes, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. And so you see, Acts, it is Luke's sequel. It is part two. I mean, it is not what we might expect, a revenge story, part two, Jesus strikes back. It is rather, it is a revival story, part two, Jesus comes to forgive, love, and offer rescue to his enemies and to those who killed him. It's astonishing. It, it, it grabs our attention. It is about what Jesus continued to do after his resurrection. Every chapter in this book, every sermon in this series, in one way or another, is about the unstoppable mission of Jesus to take the good, news of, uh, the good news of the resurrection to the ends of the earth through his church. Now for many, Acts is one of their favorite books in the whole Bible. Here's why I think Acts is so attractive. It calls us to something bigger than ourselves. It calls us to something bigger than ourselves. We humans are starving for something bigger than ourselves. The Fleet, Fox, Fleet Fox's song, Helplessness Blues, opens with these very humble and honest lyrics. The writer says this, I was raised up believing I was somehow unique, like a snowflake, distinct among snowflakes, unique in each way you can see. And now after some thinking, I'd say I'd rather be a functioning cog in some great machinery serving something beyond me. Good words, aren't they? You see, inside all of us is a yearning to be part of something bigger. One person who carried the Olympic torch said this on TV. They said, I wanted to carry the Olympic flame because, this is interesting, I wanted to be part of something bigger than just my life. Do you ever feel like that? The alarm goes, you go to work, go to bed, just building your own little kingdom. What is it all about? We've had numerous men show up at our church the last few months saying pretty much the same thing. Life's good, but there's got to be something more. You see, we are made to serve something bigger than ourselves. 
Men and women are hungry for mission. Acts is an invitation to join the greatest mission there will ever be, the unstoppable mission of Jesus to take the good news to the ends of the earth. And the big point of Acts and the big point of our text today is that the mission of Jesus is is unstoppable. Two things we need to know from chapter one this morning. Number one, Jesus has a mission for you. Number two, that mission is unstoppable. Number one, Jesus has a mission for you. After his public resurrection, Jesus goes to 11 friends. Judas, no longer with them, goes to 11 friends. Look at what they say in verse 6 to the risen Jesus. Verse 6, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, the disciples had a tiny vision for what the risen Jesus would do. They wanted him to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and just make Jerusalem great again. Boy, were they in for a surprise. Have a look, verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let me get this. Where are we? Here we go. You see, the disciples, they they, they wanted to know if Jesus was going to come and restore this tiny, tiny little place here. That was the extent of their their wildest dreams and imagination for what Jesus had come to do. But Jesus says he has come to restore the whole world. When God, throughout the whole Old Testament, promised a king, that wasn't just a king for Jerusalem. It wasn't even a king for the whole world. It was a king for the cosmos. God's plan was never to just restore this tiny patch of land here. God's plan was always to restore the whole world. And actually, see, that that makes sense of the Bible story, doesn't it? That it begins with God creating a world. We then see the world walk away from God. We see the world get cursed. And God comes to win the world back. This was the restoration of all things. The whole world invited to come back to God. A new Eden, the end of darkness, the undoing of death. I could just throw this out now. I'll leave it here. I'll leave leave it there. You see, what God was doing through Jesus, it was was so much bigger than what anybody imagined or expected. This is almost always the surprise when people come to Jesus, that our wildest dreams are too small for him. It's a great quote from the writer C.S. Lewis. He says this, It would seem that Jesus finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about when infinite joy is offered us. We're far too easily pleased. You see here in verse eight, Jesus sets out his vision. He says, if you look at verse eight, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, then the ends of the earth. And that is exactly what happens. This is actually becomes the structure of the book of Acts. The gospel goes out in three stages. Firstly, it goes out to Jerusalem. You see this here. Firstly, it goes out to Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. Then Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 through 12. And then the ends of the earth up to the end of the book. That is the structure of the book of Acts. That's what Jesus says will happen. And and it's exactly what happens. When God says something, that's what happens. Jesus calls them to be witnesses of the good news. What is the good news, church? The good news is that whilst all of us have walked away from God and could never reach heaven based on our own performance, God came down to save us in the person of Jesus Christ. It's good news. He lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. He died the death that we deserve for our sin and he historically rose to life to assure us of new life. Put simply, Jesus is how messed up people like you and me get to God. He takes us off the highway to hell. He puts us on the stairway to heaven. He pays the fare. He pays the toll. It's good news. It is very good news. And God calls us here to go and be witnesses 
of this good news. God loves telling people to go. In the Bible, God tells Moses to go uh, to Egypt. He tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. He tells us to go to the ends of the earth. God loves telling people to go. Go is two-thirds of God's name. Think about it. And look, and the word gospel begins with the word... God, now you're getting it. It's, the word gospel begins with the word go. You see, the message, it comes with a mission. We are saved in order to be sent. Every single Christian is a missionary, just in a different location. You see, we don't really go on mission trips. Rather, we are always on mission, and we sometimes go on trips. You see, the problem is we, much like the disciples here, have far too small a vision for what Jesus has come to do and what we actually think Jesus will do. Truth be told, we're comfortable with our salvation now that our soul is safe. We're comfortable with our group of people where we know everyone's name. We're quite happy to sit here until Jesus returns. But that is not Jesus' plan for the church. Just imagine for a moment that a deadly pandemic was killing everybody in Essex. Just imagine the fear. Now imagine that somebody found a cure and they had enough for everybody to be cured. It was amazing news. What would you say if they cured 3% and then just stopped? They just held little meetings for the 3% and they just kept it to themselves. That would be unthinkable, right? Yet this is how we so often behave with the gospel. Essex is the least church county in our country. You're more likely to end up on reality TV than getting into the doors of a church. There are two million people in Essex rapidly growing. It's the fastest growing county in the country. Less than 3% have any connection whatsoever to a local church. Many have never even heard the gospel. Joey Essex on a, on, a, on a TV show was famously asked, what was the name of Jesus' mother? Multiple choice. He guessed Moses. People, they've never heard the gospel. They've never heard the Bible stories. Someone needs to go and tell them. They are facing an eternity without God. The walls of our aspirations should not be the four walls of this building. That's not when we stop. That's not when we get comfortable. People need the gospel. Essex needs the gospel. We have the cure. We have the cure. God has called his church to be a lifeboat in a sea of drowning people. Our job is to pull as many into the boat as possible. That means you might need to get a bit uncomfortable. You might need to scooch up. Hey, you might have to sit next to somebody new. Oh, well, it's name bad Sunday. It's not so bad today. But, uh, we might have to start new ministries. We might have to start new churches. But we don't want to be the one caught saying that there's no more room to people that are drowning in the water. Our job is to tell as many people as we can the good news of Jesus before his return. You see, the mission to re this mission to go out and reach the world might seem overwhelming. And this is where we need to remember that we are on mission together. The way that we reach the masses is one by one. There are 500 people, give or take, in this room today. There are 6,000 people in our village. If each of us reached just three people for Christ in our lifetime, perhaps, if each of us reached just three people for Christ, and then they went out and each reached three people, that would be the entire village saved. One generation, perhaps. Jesus himself carefully invested in just 12 disciples over three years, and through them he reached the whole world. See, if, if you sit reading your Bible and you think that you alone have to go out and reach the world, you probably won't start because it, the, the job is too big. But if you can reach three people, you could be part of a movement that could easily reach England in our generation if the Lord moved. Think of all God accomplished in a single generation in acts from just 11, 11 frightened dudes your home group alone could have a game-changing impact on this country and on our world. Jesus has a mission for you. Do you know that? Do you believe that? 
Jesus has a mission for you. Let's get going. Let's get going. Here's the second thing we need to know from Acts chapter 1. His mission is unstoppable. The big theme of Acts is that Jesus' mission is unstoppable. And that is true because of our commander. Look at verses 9 to 11 with me. 9 to 11. After he, Jesus, said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. You see, this is a crucial and yet often overlooked moment called the ascension. When people think of Jesus, if you went out on the streets today, or even if I asked you guys, what do you think of when I say Jesus? People generally think of the baby, the carpenter, or the man on the cross, right? Baby, the carpenter, or the man on the cross. That's history. Jesus is no longer a baby. Jesus is no longer a carpenter. And hallelujah, Jesus is no longer hanging on a cross. Exactly 40 days after his public execution and resurrection, we are told that Jesus Christ publicly ascended into heaven before their eyes, where we are told, told that he now rules all things with all authority. You see, the, the ascension is woefully underplayed in our thinking about Jesus. We love Christmas and Easter. We love thinking about the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I guess they're, they're a bit more grounded for us to get our head around. But the ascension gets overlooked. Even many Christian doctrine books go incarnation, cross, resurrection, and then jump to Pentecost. They miss the ascension. In many countries today, Ascension Day is considered so important it is a national holiday. The Christian uh, church father, Augustine, said, Ascension Day should be the greatest of all Christian festivals. Now, that may be swinging the pendulum too far, but you get that previous Christians recognized its importance. And it is important because of where Jesus sits today. We, we sometimes talk about kings and queens ascending to the throne. This is the supreme example. It's important that Jesus didn't just disappear, never to be seen again. Where's Jesus gone? We don't know. He disappeared. Jesus did not disappear. He ascended. The ascension was a visible demonstration that Jesus is now enthroned in heaven. His ascension was his coronation. Jesus is now, this, this was the crowning of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It must have looked mind-blowingly dramatic, whoosh, up into the clouds, and they stood there in awe, looking up at the sky. Now, this, this miraculous event might sound ridiculous, too unbelievable for you. After all, you're somebody who follows the facts. Well, consider this fact. Something big happened to convince all of these countless eyewitnesses to give up everything, including their life, in order to tell us what happened. They gain nothing for telling these stories, materially, financially, relationally. They, they, they gave up their lives. They were put to death in the most brutal ways for passing on the truth of what happened. What do you do with that? You see, the ascension recorded, carefully documented for us here. It was designed to show the disciples and us that Jesus didn't just disappear. He went to a place. Consider this. Right now, Jesus is sat on a throne in a place, in a real place. There is a man sat on a throne in a real place. The Bible repeatedly, unapologetically, emphatically tells us that there is a spiritual world all around us that we can't see. And in that place, Jesus Christ is sat on the throne as the King of Kings, ruling over all things. We're going to see in Acts 7 this moment when Stephen, just before he is killed, before he becomes the first ever Christian martyr, before they stone him, he is looking out, and God peels back, 
peels back for a moment. He gives him, his eyes are opened and he sees Jesus sat on the throne. You see this reality, it is, it is unseen and yet it is very real. Brothers and sisters, the ascension means that we are not waiting for Jesus to be crowned at the end of time. He's already crowned. He's already won. He already rules. There's no decision to be made over which religion is right, over which worldview will win. Jesus is already crowned. Heaven isn't waiting for humans to decide what the truth is. This isn't a popularity contest. It's not, it's not an opinion poll. It's not a democratic election. Jesus isn't canvassing for supporters in order to get into office. Vote Jesus. Jesus is already crowned. You see, the ascension, it tells us that Jesus is king today, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. This might sound very confronting, but this is designed unapologetically to be confronting. It is designed to shake us out of living our whole lives with apathy or vague relativity, sitting on the fence. It's designed to shake us up, to say, wake up, run away from the confusion of the world, come to Christ. You know the stories, you know how carefully they were recorded, you know how people gave their lives to pass it on. You've seen how the church has gone out, just like Jesus said. Come to Christ today, what are you waiting for? Acts 1 presents us with the true king, the most truest reality. And he is a king who left his throne for the cross in order to win your soul. He is a good king. He's a good king. He is the one who all of us will meet when we die. Will you meet him as a friend or a foe? Because his hands are held out to you today. Will you take them? Christian, here is what the ascension means for you, for us. It means that our mission cannot fail. Everything Jesus says will happen, happens. Jesus told 11 friends that his gospel would go out to the ends of the earth. It seemed madness. They were 11 nobodies. But that's what happened. We can see it today with our own eyes. The gospel has truly gone to the ends of the earth. We're going to see it as we go through Acts. We're going to see the gospel break into the Roman Empire. It must have seemed totally impenetrable to Jesus' earliest followers. Cornelius converts in around 40 AD. By the year 280 AD, Christianity was the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. That must have blown their minds if they knew that. This gives us hope, thinking whatever group you think is unreachable today, the woke, the LGBT, the, the Islamic community, Jesus can reach them. Jesus is reaching them. In Acts, we're going to see the gospel go out to Europe and Africa. Today, there are 700 million Christians in Africa. Can you imagine the apostles' faces if you told them that? Very soon, four in ten Christians will be African in the world. You see, this, this idea that gets peddled around that Christianity is a white Western religion, it's nonsense. It's a myth that needs debunking. It started out in the middle and it's going all over. Today, there are Christians pouring into the, into the kingdom in all over Asia. Projections suggest that it might well soon be the dominant religion in China. You see, it is going out all over the world, just like Jesus said. In Acts 9, we're going to come across that famous story of Saul, perhaps the most unlikely person to ever come to faith on planet Earth. He had a kind of first century Richard Dawkins or Stephen Fry, hardwired against Christianity, committed his life to just mocking it. Paul meets the risen Christ. He has his Damascus experience. He gives his life to follow Christ. He turns around. He repents. He comes home. He accepts the gospel. It takes great humility to accept the gospel. It's the best message in the world. It's free. Why don't people take it? It takes humility. It takes you coming to God and saying, I can't do this on my own. 
I can't get into heaven based on just me. And that is when the gospel becomes good news. Jesus says, I'll do it for you. This is the story of history. God says unlikely things will happen and they happen. Think about the story of the Bible just for a moment. God says to this tiny desert people, I'll make you big. Behold, they get big. God says they'll be exiled, they exile. God says they'll return, they return. God says, Jesus, Jesus. God says resurrection, resurrection. God says that the church will go global, it goes global. God says Jesus will return. He will return. God says he's gonna restore all things. He'll do it. That's not blind faith. That is going with the grain of history. The mission of Jesus is unstoppable, church. I hope this encourages us. There is one final thing I want to draw out from these verses in the time that we have left. The rest you're going to have to go and look at in home groups, chat about over tea and coffee. You see, in verses 12 through 26, we get this story where the disciples are replacing Judas with another eyewitness uh, called Matthias in order to restore the 12. Uh, One point, lots we could say, one point just to make from these verses. They were very ordinary people. It's surprising that Jesus entrusts this important mission, soul-saving mission, to bozos like Peter, James, and John. Last time we saw Peter, he was denying he even knew Jesus to to young girls he didn't even know. Here now, Jesus chooses Peter to take his gospel to the world. They were very ordinary men, but they were God's plan A for the mission. They were his A team. They were the A apostles. They weren't the B apostles. They were God's plan. These ordinary people were God's plan A for the mission. That is hugely encouraging for you and me. Because if Jesus can use failing, stumbling people like Peter, he can use us. And ultimately, the success of this mission, it doesn't lie in the hands of the messenger, but the Messiah. This gives us huge courage, knowing it is not our power to save people. It's not the perfectly formulated words. It's not the degree of passion that we say them with. It's not the perfect timing that you say it. It's the power of God. God simply calls us to tell the good news. God opens blind eyes. It's his power. He's been doing it for a long time. He's doing it today. Have faith. Have courage. Go and tell your friends. Acts is the story of ordinary people doing extraordinary things by the Spirit. President Woodrow Wilson once said, I would rather fail in a cause that would ultimately succeed than succeed in a cause that will ultimately fail. You see, the book of Acts, it is an invitation away from succeeding in life at the things that ultimately don't really matter and will ultimately fail, to come and join a glorious mission that can only succeed. Let me pray for us. Dear God, thank you so much for the good news of Jesus Christ. We are so grateful for it. This gospel that calls us from darkness to light, that saves us from hell for heaven, that calls us from meaninglessness to mission. Would we be those who respond in faith today? We pray in the mighty, ascended, glorious, ruling name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.